<coughs> Today, uh, we have uh, uh, talked by uh, my co-curator, Lin Chen Xian, on uh, what did Raffles see? Chen, of course, uh, as some of you may already know, uh, is an archaeologist. So, not only is he an archaeologist, he is a collector of maps, of uh, old books, and of uh, basic information about early Singapore, uh, and of course of the World War II period as well. So, uh, just to, to give you the background behind how these talks came about, uh, when we decided that uh, we would do the Raffles exhibition uh, upstairs on the 10th floor, and if you haven't been, I encourage you to do so because we have to return the artifacts to the Butte Archives by the end of this month. It's already February, so at the end of this month, the exhibition will close and you'll never get to see these artifacts again. Um, we, Chen, Bo Chen and I actually uh, got to know about these letters uh, from uh, Dr. John Bastin, who is a leading uh, Raffles scholar, and uh, this was sometime in 2009. It's taken us that long to actually negotiate to get the letters here and to stage the exhibition. And in conjunction with this exhibition, a series of talks uh, have been organized. Uh, those of you who were here last week would have heard uh, Dr. Yo Kang Shua talking about the Jackson Town plan, right? And uh, much earlier, I had given a talk about uh, Raffles and, and, and sort of. Uh, uh, law and politics in the founding of modern Singapore. So today, uh, this is the last of our talks, right? Uh, yes. uh, in conjunction with the Raffles series, and uh, you know, I'm very happy to to be able to introduce uh, Lim Chen Xian. Uh, Chen holds, uh, wears many many hats. Among other things, he's visiting research fellow at the Archaeology Unit at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, but he also uh, does you know ten thousand other things. He doesn't <laughs> sleep, I think. Um, so. With that, uh, please welcome uh, Lim Chen Xian and uh, Wally Raffles C. Thank you, Kevin. I, I do sleep, but uh, I do go by the adage of you can sleep as much as you want when you die. So, uh, yes, I, I do look quite terrible. I was just released from my uh, all expenses paid five star holiday with the Singapore military yesterday. So, and, uh, that just came up a bit, and uh, hence I'm back in action. Here giving this talk. Uh, I'm feeling a bit under the weather today, so if, if you uh, not mind, I'm, I may take a pause and have a drink once in a while. Uh, and I may be mumbling a bit, so in case if I uh, mumble too much, please stop me. But I've been told I mumble all the time, and anyway, whether I'm ill or not, so <laughs> please do stop me and uh, maybe talk a bit more. Or we can keep it informal a little, so as uh, I, I show you the slides and pictures. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. You may want to ask more questions. Sure, we can take a break and we'll talk about it, <laughs> rather than me going on and on and on. But effectively, I, I won't be talking much. I'll let Mr. Raffles and his contemporaries talk to you today through his letters and writings, and through you know, his contemporaries, though not necessarily just Raffles alone, uh, of what they saw, uh, what did these guys see in Singapore in uh, 1819 to 1825, there about the early years of East India Company, when it was a factory. It was just a settlement. It was. Um, uh, 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 a treaty was signed with the local princes and they were allowed to set up a little factory, a little settlement to trade. And that's about it. So what was, what was it that these guys, these new people, these Orang Kute, these Angmoor people came for the first time to Singapore? And what did they see? Right, so that's what it came about. Um, it came about, effectively, not so much of just an exhibition, but I'm always interested in early uh, history of Singapore. Because as Kevin said, I'm an archaeologist and it's always very interesting to try to figure out uh, what sort of archaeological remains are there and based on historical records. So like, you know, where's Raffles House, where did Fuakwa live, and, uh, where's the laundry land, you know, where's the police station, things like that. So maybe would that appear in the archaeological record? Uh, we've been searching for early colonial Singapore for the past 30 years now. Uh, not very successful, mind you, but I'll show you some of the other things which we've been uncovering over the last 30 years. Alright, so let's uh, uh, plunge into it and try to go back in time to 1819, see what Mr. Raffles saw. Uh, interesting enough, although Raffles is a very famous personality in Singapore, uh, uh, who is apparently a great man, a great visionary, great everything, he's one of the one of course, founding father of uh, Singapore, uh, he spent very little time in Singapore. In fact, he only came to Singapore three times. And these are the three occasions he was in Singapore. Very first time, um, 1819, uh, January 28th, that's when he first anchored off 
uh, St. John's Island, and then they sailed to the harbor, and then landed in Singapore, and signed the treaty. Right? And the treaty, of course, most of us will know is the sign on the first treaty was signed on the 6th of February, 1819, and he left the very next day. Where did he go? Well, rebels wear many different hats. So, not just me, but he was the lieutenant governor of uh, Bankul, Bankulan in uh, southwest Sumatra. And on top of that, he was a special agent for the governor general of uh, India. And on top of that, he has a lot of other things he's interested in, natural history, languages, music, all sorts of stuff. So he's very busy. So the next day, he disappeared to Penang, going back up to report to his immediate boss, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bannerman, who was the lieutenant governor of uh, Penang. The second time he came back to Singapore was a couple of months later, in the same year, in May. Uh, he spent about a month there, for uh, four, four weeks in Singapore, left in June. And the last time he came to Singapore was in 1822. And he spent over maybe close to eight months. And that was the big change where he started planning all sorts of things. And last uh, week, I believe, he had started because Professor Dr. Yeo gave the talk on about Lieutenant Phillips, uh, Lieutenant uh, Jackson, yeah, Jackson. Jackson plan, right? The 1822 town plan. It was that period when Raffles was planning, very busy planning how Singapore would look like, where would we put in your roads, which different ethnicity would live where, where these were all plans. And well, as you, those of you who attended the talk last week, you realized that maybe not all the plans were keep the foundation, right? It has no plans, but it did happen. So that was the last period of in Singapore, which he actually took control uh, from his old friend, uh, Colonel Farquhar and took control of uh, the management of Singapore. Now, those are three occasions when he came to Singapore. Maybe I'll just go back a little bit. And so you can just imagine how much he could have seen within those few periods. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have viewed the uh, letters upstairs. So those of you who haven't been to the exhibition, I do encourage you to have a look. It's free, so you can spend as much time as you want in there. Uh, and have a look at the letters that record wrote. The importance for these viewed uh, letters is because they are the letters that are most contemporaneous with the founding of Singapore. It is closest to the date that was found, that think, when he founded Singapore. And this, uh, part, a few letters were written when he was in Singapore in his second trip. So these, these were very close to the contextual nature of it. But Raffles, is, although he writes a lot of letters, unfortunately, at least for me, he didn't really talk a lot about Singapore. He talked a lot about Singapore in the political sense, how great it is, you know, this is good. This, this little place will grow, there's so many people, there, there are a lot of Chinese coming, lots of junk, that you've seen in a while. But he, he, he spent very little time describing the actual things in Singapore. Uh, so in this talk, I supplemented with other contemporaries of his, so around the time period, a few others who have written about Singapore, um, who actually describe Singapore in more detail than reference. And it's based on these few uh, different descriptions, letters, and, and secondary accounts, we can try to figure out exactly Maybe Raffles should have seen those things when he was here in 1819 or 1822. Uh, he must have, but perhaps he didn't record it down. Or perhaps, actually, Raffles may have recorded it down, but unfortunately his papers were lost. You do know that his uh, possessions were destroyed in this uh, the ship, right? The sinking of the uh, thing, the thing, thing. So he caught fire and sank, and all these things were, uh, were destroyed. So perhaps he might have noticed it, he might have written it. The description of Singapore, uh, uh, during the period of founding was by uh, Captain Daniel Ross. Now, Daniel Ross was part of the crew that came with Raffles. They were, uh, Raffles, this, these guys were working for Raffles as uh, hydrographers, surveyors. They were going around charting the grounds around Singapore, along the streets of Malacca, down the streets of Singapore to China. They were trying to, try to create new charts and new maps of the sea, the uh, people made, up to China. So he, was, he came along with Raffles, and he was one of the few Europeans uh, who landed the plane. And of course, fortunately for us, he left behind a short description of how uh, Singapore looked like on 7 February 1819. Now, that's one day after the signing of the treaty, right? So it's, it's, it's very, very close to the, the, the original founding date of Singapore. Well, I won't bore you by reading through it, so um, <laughs> I think it's a bit difficult for me my throat right now. But you can see how he describes various things in, in, in Singapore. Say a pleasant looking hill, it's partly clear of trees, uh, between the point at which the town is situated. Now this is interesting. He actually mentioned a town that's really there. So it's not just uh, an empty plot of land which, you know, uh, which, which they, they clean slate which they built a town on. So there was some things happening there. 
stuff. And interest, uh, fortunately for us, he has quite a number of these navigational charts that accompany his description. So Daniel Ross, like I told you, he was a hydrographer. And his main interest was to sound out the depths of the harbor, so that's Singapore Harbor. Maybe we can get the lights dim a little so we can upgrade things for them. <coughs> and this is where the ships would have anchored off, and that's St. John's Island right here. A little bit of uh, Lacan Martin or Santosa Island right, right in the end. So you can see Singapore River right here. And there's a little town or village. Notice there's another small village up here. But you no, know, I, I won't go into detail for this on this chart, but just to show you that there are other people out there who are with this article recording, but this is how does it work, right? It's his job to make these navigational charts. We were very fortunate that a couple of years ago, uh, back in 2007, these uh, images of Singapore appeared in the British uh, National Archive of Formerly known as the Public Records Office. They have been sitting in the Admiralty office for the last 200 years, and suddenly they, they were released to the, the National Archives and under, underwent conservation. And finally, a researcher who was working on, on early Penang uncovered it, uh, Marcus Langdon, and realized the importance of it for the history of Singapore. What's so important about it? The importance is a little bit tiny. It's the date, 7 February 1819. So this is the, effectively the very first visual image of Singapore. And this is what Raffles would have seen as he stood on, on his ship, anchored off the St. John Islands, or anchored off the Singapore Rose, the Singapore Harbour. Uh, of course, Singapore Harbour today would be uh, Marina Bay Sands, the casino complex, right, because of reclamation. So he would be somewhere around there. You can imagine looking over, uh, over the, the, his, uh, the, the, the railing of the ship and looking out at Singapore. Now, in the center strip here, this is effectively the town of Singapore. And of course, it's a panorama, so it goes all the way down to, to uh, the Dokko. So we will avoid that for now. So that's a little central strip. I've loaded up a little bit. Um, it's not that clear, unfortunately, but here you can see, if you bear with me, that that itself is the village of Singapore, as it says there. So it's quite an extensive little town, a little village that's really existed, which is Daniel Ross, you, you saw in the first description of this slide, you mentioned about a little town, like a pleasant little town that existed there. Uh, the interesting thing about this little uh, the visual, or sketch itself, is the existence of another village, a second village, uh, towards the north of Singapore town, or the village of Singapore. Well, it's called Riot Village. Uh, in Malay, it means the people's village, or the subordinate village, or something along those lines. So that's another village. This is an approximate proximity of, um, of Kampung Glam today. And later, I'll show you, this is where uh, Sultan Hussein, or later Sultan Hussein, well, today, 2007, it became Sultan Hussein. Sun Kulong was promoted to Sultan Hussein by uh, Raffles, recognized as the legitimate uh, Sultan of Singapore at Johor. And there was sort of this little kampong, or this little enclave there. Whereas the village, the village of Singapore, the bigger village to the left, was the domain of Temungung Abdul Rahman, who theoretically is the subordinate of uh, Sultan Hussein. Uh, I also like to draw attention to another little area right here. This is the mouth of the Singapore River. Uh, do you know where the Malayan is, right? So, I mean, the old Malayan, not the new big Malayan, but those of you in my generation remember that the old Malayan. You know, but the boat house now is a fancy restaurant, a French restaurant, right there. But notice this mast. So ships, European ships, were anchored into the Singapore River itself. So the harbour itself extends all the way into the Singapore River. It makes sense, it's tidal. Um, and of course it's easier for docking and unloading of goods. And in fact, Franco had one of his ships anchored off uh, uh, Emperor's Place as a storehouse, because prior to setting up their, their, their commissariat and the quartermaster store. We needed a temporary structure. And the ship stayed there for more than half, half a year, just serving them as a storehouse. So let's go back a little before uh, the 7th February. The signing of the treaty is held on 6th of February. Uh, we all know what happened. Uh, the two local princes will, 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 will give it the corded the honor they deserve. Uh, Raffles recognized Sultan uh, Tungkulong as the rightful Sultan of Singapore. So he needed somebody to sign a treaty with, right? He can't just come here and take the land. 
So Mungu Abdurrahman, when he first came on 28th of January, we met Mungu Abdurrahman and Mungu Abdurrahman said, you're not sure the Dutch are not here, or you said, welcome to set up base here. But, however, I have a boss on top of me, so we need to get my boss to so go. It's a very typical bureaucratic type thing. Oh, however, it's someone on top of me, right? So this guy said, well, it's Mungu Long. And Mungu Long, unfortunately, we will go into detail of um, how he did not get um, uh, to, to be, get to the throne of uh, the, to be the Sultan of Riau and Johor. So Raffles instead recognized him as the Sultan of Singapore. And he mentioned about giving them allowance and this and that. We all know that Spanish dollars and 3,000 for Tamungo and 4,800 for uh, the Sultan. The interesting thing about this is one of the first references to Tamungo Abdurrahman's gun battery. So even at that point when they, when they arrived, uh, Raffles and Farquhar unloaded the European artillery, their own troops and everything, military stores. But there's a reference to Tamungu Abdul Rahman's own gun battery. Now, what exactly is a battery? A battery effectively is just a military jargon for uh, a bunch of guns, a bunch of artillery pieces, cannons. Uh, if you do know Singapore well enough, you know there's a battery road, right? Battery road down, going down to Fullerton Square, uh, that area. Well, there used to be a gun battery there in a fort, so it's called Battery Road. Raffles uh, wrote in a very detailed report to this fellow called uh, John Adams, uh, his, his letters featured upstairs, on February 13th, so a few days after the found, uh, signing of the treaty and the founding of Singapore. Now, in this very, very detailed letter, which stressed, I don't know, 26 pages or something like that, he goes to the point by point, all this explanation of how much he paid and description of the area. And John Adams is a very important uh, character in, in the Indian government. He was the political secretary to Lord Hastings, the Governor General of India. So he wrote directly to you to report what happened. And today's presentation, a lot of these letters you see you, is based on the 13th February letter of his description of Singapore. This is an artist's impression of how uh, the treaty, the day of the, the signing of the treaty, we look like. Uh, we don't really know, it's just an artist sketch, it's the movement's house, and look at the Rangan, which is the Singapore hero, later became Fort Canning. This is a Plumas Art Pocket, the banqueting can, the cannons, the row of batteries, a gun battery, the treaty tent, and that's about it. And those of you probably in my generation remember, there used to be a wax museum in San Jose, and you see this little wax figurine of these guys signing the treaties and stuff like that, right? Probably that burns into your memory. But effectively, we have very little records of what how that, that, that scene looked like. It's really a figment of someone's imagination. And just like this too, it's really a figment of someone's imagination. However, we're very fortunate that in the Butte archives, uh, there is a map that was discovered, at least, well, not really discovered, but at least released to us in Singapore, to the public. Uh, we provisionally dated to around 1819, 1820, 1820 would be a safer date. So this will become one of the earliest landward facing map of Singapore, showing <coughs> showing the development of the town, the little village and everything else. So this is on display upstairs, this is a massive map, uh, it's a replica on display. Uh, the map itself measures about 1.2 just by 90, by 90 centimeters, so it's, it's large. It's a replica. The original is still in Butte, uh, the Butte archive, it was too expensive to to uh, pay the insurance and bring it here, so we made a replica of it.